recording this, but not live stream. So, <laughs> so, so as the bishop says on Wednesday morning calls, anything you say will be heard by the bishops. <laughs> So let me ask, and we'll, we'll try my time things right, I'm not great at that. 
uh, if I had to kind of end here. But so if it's all of those things, why why the controversy whenever we talk about change? things we have liturgies for and what those liturgies say and do. We say that the experience of those things week after week, year after year, we form the Anglican belief system inside the person. And this is that the, the uh, phrase that I forget, I put it in so this Latin phrase, lex orandi, lex credendi, which goes back all the way to the 4th and 5th century, but it's, it's the shortening of a, of a longer Latin sentence that means, let the way that we pray let the way that we worship form the way that we believe. So lex orandi, praying, lex credendi, believing. Some people tack on a third part, which I actually like, which and let the way we believe form the way we live, lex credendi. But we won't talk about that in this class. But let the way that we pray, let the way that we worship form the way that we believe. So we come into worship uh, 
I'm not a blank space, that's over, overstating things, but we come into worship open to what we're going to experience there corporately, in common, together, and over time that forms our belief system. So one of the, uh, it's actually now the bishop of, I'm gonna say Milwaukee, doesn't matter, we put it in the guys out in the Midwest, uh, but Peter Lee uh, wrote years ago a book on, on the prayer book, and he said, he referred to Anglicanism as a pragmatic church, a church that doesn't put a strong attachment on any particular confession or doctrine, but allows itself of each worshiper, of each parishioner, allows the self to be formed by worship. So that's one of the reasons that we have the prayer book. We, we believe that what we do in worship, by doing it all together and in a regular way, we, we form ourselves as believing faithful Christians. The other thing which a lot of us would is it's common, and it's very intentional, I think, that the word common is used in the title of the book. So we have in common rights, whether you go here, or in New Haven, or to Los Angeles, you will, on a Sunday, you will largely hear the same liturgy being done largely the same way, with differences at the margins, of course. And the big change, not for us, but in the medieval period, uh, or coming from the medieval period, language of the church in England until Thomas Cranmer was Latin. Uh, it was a language that very few people spoke. Almost no one outside the clerical order or the very educated elite understood. Uh, and it got to the point, I think where a lot of us are familiar with this, that Eucharist worship of any kind in, in, the, in the church in England before the English Reformation became almost an audience thing rather than a participation thing. You went and watched the clergy perform, and I don't use that pejoratively, but you watched them perform a liturgy, you knew the Our Father, you may have known a couple other things in the Mass, but other than that, it was very common to sit there and, and pray with prayer beads, uh, or to meditate, or I'm guessing to bring something else to do until, until, until the host was elevated and you all would all yeah. so, so the English Reformation made a big deal about putting the language of the by finding that way that we worship into the common language that can be understood and readily participated in by all. Uh, other traditions have a more emphasis on more spontaneous and more heartfelt prayer. And I I always bristle might be too strong. I always just punch my shoulders a little bit when I hear that, because it isn't that we exclude any heartfelt prayer. We write some prayers, we pray separately all the time, both in worship and, and more commonly, uh, but, we, uh, but we have this idea that using the same words in the same rhythm of liturgies over the calendar year uh, brings us together, unites us as a body of believers more than if we just sort of all pray our own way any given Sunday, which is perfectly legitimate. Uh, and many of us have many traditions that do that, but it, it does lack that. And the last benefit I think of a prayer book is having the liturgies available. Um, and in two senses of that word, um, in sort of the, the reactive sense, uh, it is a great comfort uh, when a baby is born, when somebody passes away, when somebody is sick, when people are going to be married. It's a great comfort to have something to turn to and not feel like we have to make up something to figure out what, what God has to tell us about those events, and also how, how God is involved in those events, how grace flows through those, uh, through those events. Uh, but it's also, I think, a, a proactive opportunity that by having various liturgies available in the prayer book, um, an example I cite, if you were here a couple weeks ago, we, we celebrated the Feast of the Dedication, the anniversary of the consecration of that building, I had never found until planning for that Sunday. There's a beautiful litany tucked in the mid 500s of this book about the, the, the building and the growth and the existence of a church, and not just the parish, but actually the building itself. And as we, as you find that, you go, "Wow, this this prayer that was written years ago, if not centuries ago, this prayer actually helps me think about this place, this family, that building, 
in ways I hadn't thought of before. Uh, and it kind of trains my thoughts to go in, in different ways. So this thing is that, is that reactive, oh gosh, something's happened, whether it's good or bad, what kind of liturgy do we use to experience that? But also let me open up this book and see what it has to say about this or that. And let me let me cast my thoughts and prayers in that in that direction. And, and then I guess the final little part about why a prayer book would not stop the questions that we're writing. That, that we call it a prayer book, but it is obviously more than just prayer. There are plenty of colleagues and other prayers uh, in the prayer book, but it has our liturgies and services. It's the book that tells us what passages of the Bible we're going to read at what services every single day of the weekend of the feast. It has those calendars that tell us when the feasts are and when, it doesn't tell us exactly by day when Easter is, but it tells us how to figure out when Easter is. If for some reason we don't have a calendar, it just lets us do that. Because <laughs> yeah, it's very complicated. Uh, and there's a catechism. Uh, we won't get to it in this part of the course, maybe in November, but there, there is, if you are looking for something a little bit confessional small c, there is a catechism in the back of the book that you can work through. It forms a great curriculum for teenagers, and I would even say adults, to sort of work through that over a period of seven or eight weeks and just say, what do we believe as, as Anglican principles of faith? Any questions thus far? Anne? I know there was a period in which anyone who wrote anything, any learned person who asked this or somebody asked that, would write it in Latin. And Obviously, there must have been a break. I don't know how it was in England. I learned something about what it was like in France. Um, when, when they decided that the vernacular was suitable for important written material, I mean, did that have any uh, connection with the idea to translate into the vernacular? I, I might turn to the more professional academics in the room. Uh, all I would say is, from the little bit that I know, Church, the English church's foray into the vernacular was way, way ahead of the academies. That the, the language remained, that Latin remained the lingua franca, franca, franca of the academy well after the church had gone to English. But Ron, do you know anything or anybody yeah, else? I, I agree. I think that still, even Ron, we're having to talk to Catholics, but I mean, mm -hmm. Latin things still, you're very right about that. But it would seem to me that and there was an awful lot of move towards commonality, not the least of which was the printing press and the theater. Right. You know, these are first things, first theater in Shakespeare, they called the theater because there wasn't any other. <laughs> so that idea that there really is an audience of common audience was coming up around this time. Yeah, there was a there was a time when at the university I thought they would still do plays in, in Latin. At my university. Oh, well, there's also a political thing that the Anglican Church, through the prayer book, really got a common participation of the public that granted them some latitude, and they did because of overriding commands from Rome, you know, and the only way I can think of this as a vernacular is that old song in the 60s, I don't know whether you remember Tom Blair, the Vatican rag, first you get down on your knees and fiddle with your rosary, bow your knees and great respect. And it was all do anything you wanted, but blessed by the pontiff. It was this overriding, this is what you do, and it comes from Rome. And then in England, you began to get the people involved, and they can interpret it, and they can follow it with a certain degree of flexibility. And this was totally new for the time. And, and, and not altogether unfriendly. Uh, there were plenty of people who didn't, didn't want it, didn't feel comfortable with it. To, to Bonnie's point before, it shifted decades of going to church and hearing 
nothing that I understood, but I understood what was happening, even if I didn't understand the words. Yes, I mean, I know. Mr. Kramer didn't exactly get a thank you. Exactly. Yes, yes. We'll get to that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But yet there's contrast between the, the academic and the Ulterior, well, 
she didn't and last we'll... long after that. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, yes, eventually. <laughs> so, uh, but in some ways, and I don't mean to be flipped about saying this, I, but in some ways, we have her to thank uh, for the for the patrimony that we've inherited, even though she didn't she didn't uh, last very long after after the, uh, the reforms that she had instituted. Uh, but Catholic, that Henry Rell keeps the theology and the practices of the church, including the Latin, uh, in place uh, for all of his life. The only re major reform that Henry undertakes, and it cannot be understated, is the dissolution of monasteries. Uh, that's, that could be a whole other course, and I, I love all this stuff, but in a sentence, let me just say, monastery, more so than anywhere else in Europe, probably, monasteries were part of the fabric of the life of England. Almost nobody in Lived more than a comfortable walk, comfortable walk away from the monastery, and maybe two or three. And in the way they fed people, in the way they governed land, in the way they administered justice, and of course in the way they helped worship happen throughout England, throughout the realm, monasteries were hugely important. Because they were important, they were hugely wealthy. And Henry couldn't resist, could not keep his hands out of the monastic cookie jars. And instituted uh, what is known to history as the dissolution of the monasteries, which I think sounds much more um, uh, generic and uh, neutral than it is. He, he really ravaged a, a system, a social system, a system of social order that had existed for centuries in Europe, in, in England, uh, and to this day, uh, you can go and tour these monasteries in various states of disrepair and get a get a view of what. What it was like at um, at Bravo, uh, at Bravo in, in northeastern England. Uh, I have a picture of it somewhere. There is, uh, you know, an ingot of lead. So this, so there is at this ingot or whatever you want to call it, is literally the size of a coffin. It's it's at least this long, at least this tall, at least this wide, uh, with Henry's stamp uh, embossed right upon it. And the little sign that I saw next to it said, this was one of thousands of these. That was all the stuff that he melted down, uh, not because he necessarily wanted or needed the lead, but he didn't want the monasteries to be able to be rebuilt. So he, he, he didn't just sort of take all the people out of them. He, he consciously destroyed them. I'm, I'm that's more than I can even say. So, <laughs> but let's so say that's the only real thing that Henry did. Henry dies in 1547. Eventually, his son, Edward VI, son of, uh, that he had with James Seymour, becomes the boy king. And that's the first real move that we get into what becomes the English Reformation. And in some ways, that first prayer book, which comes two years later, is the opening salvo, if you will, of the English Reformation. It might surprise you to learn, uh, Cranmer is still the archbishop. Uh, the, the idea is presented to Edward and uh, that we really need a prayer book. We need to do what, whatever your father was able to do. We are now thirsty for 15 years later. We really, we're no longer wanting to be the English branch of the Roman Church. We want to be an English church that follows its own, its own doctrines and its own practices. So the, the story goes that Thomas Hamner as Archbishop uh, and 12 other bishops were commissioned. They met at Lambeth Palace, still the home of the Archbishop of Canterbury in London, and in three weeks, three weeks, put together the 1549 version of the Book of Common Prayer. It was a relatively conservative document in that it took a lot of the existing Roman Catholic liturgies, translated them into English, they were called translations of the Eastern already, collated them, but kept the, the practices and the liturgical flow, if you will, of very close to what it had been under Henry VIII. And in typical fashion, this annoyed everybody. The, the traditionalists were mad because it was now in English, and some things had been dropped out, particularly a lot of the saint, uh, saint days and a lot of the veneration of the saints. And for the reformists, it didn't go nearly far. Before we talk more about the history of, of the prayer book, uh, a little bit about where that 1549 document came from. It's easy to say, yes, it from all the Roman Catholic stuff that's on the shelf. But I think it's important to realize that even, you know, including the book that we have today, the sources are very limited. 
we, we can go in the scripture, in some ways, this is some of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. We get reference in 1st and 2nd Samuel, in Deuteronomy, uh, even, uh, well, yeah, throughout, the, and then later in the second, second Temple period, we get all these references to temple worship. We know imperfectly and idealistically, I mean, the writings are not, you know, eyewitness accounts. We know what happened in the two temples, the worship of the two temples at Jerusalem. We know Jesus doesn't, that there was teaching at synagogues. You know, remember, he's a boy, and he unrolls the scroll, uh, and says, reads the passage from Isaiah, that this word has been fulfilled today in your hearing, right? You know, that we know that there's teaching going on in the synagogues. The Lord's Supper, uh, the, 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 <coughs> the upper room, uh, the day before he hangs on the cross, we know is, a, is uh, an adaptation or an expression, sorry, a better word, an expression of, English, of Jewish table prayers, of Jewish table blessings. And we also know that, and this is reflected in scripture, that there was a pattern of daily prayer that involved a combination of prayers that were said in the temple for the people, by the people technically, but for the people, right? and then prayers that you were expected as a devout Jew, Jew to do at home. All of those things end up in some way or other in the temple prayer book. So the scripture as a source. 19th and 20th century scholarship then really began to break over patterns of the early church. We, we get more and more writings in Latin and in Greek, uh, primarily, uh, of what it was like to worship in the first and second century. Um, there is, maybe I'll send it around, but um, Justin Martyr wrote in about the middle of the first, of the second century uh, of this era, uh, and he, out, he wrote about a lot of things, but in, toward the end of what he wrote, there's an outline of what we do every Sunday. And if I just copied out those paragraphs and changed it, you know, obviously changed a couple of Latin words and things like that, but you know, wrote stuff that's purely Roman, I think you would find a great resemblance to what we do every Sunday there. You know, in the structure of the Eucharist, we can trace back almost 2,000 years, and it comes down to this. As the same with the daily office, same with baptism. Baptism, you needed with a, with a new, uh, I'm talking about this next week, but with a new and threatening and anti-establishment church. You needed a way to initiate people in so they felt like they were part of the church that didn't cause upheaval of the rest of your life. You know, if you suddenly started wearing a badge saying I'm a Christian everywhere you went, you wouldn't have lasted long. Uh, but baptism, you know, permanent grace with an ephemeral sign of water, what, what an interesting way to, to introduce people into the church. So, Scriptural sources that go into the prayer book, we've got early church resources that go into the prayer book. And I, I said that was like in the 19th, 20th century. There, there was scholarship. We knew some of the ancient sources in Cranmer's time, uh, particularly the ones in, in the more eastern church, but they really come to the fore in the last hundred or so years. Then, of course, the medieval Roman Catholic press. Um, the church, beginning around the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, had really pushed for regularization. Somewhat like we, we talked about at the beginning of this class, the, the Roman Catholic Church had not historically exercised such liturgical governance over the individual parishes. A lot of that was left to the local bishops. Some local bishops left it more to the individual priests in the parishes. Um, starting around 1200, the church, this I'm going to go over here, um, it, but the church, the Roman Catholic Church, the church at the time decided things needed to be this is when we start getting missiles. This is the book that says, this is what you do when you say mass, and we get ordinal. This is what you do when you ordain people. And you get antiphonals to say, this is what, the, this is what you sing before you say the psalm, and this is what you, so this collection of books that prescribes, on one hand prescribes liturgy, but on the other hand gives it that commonality that we've talked about as a, as a plus. Do uh, they gives face it, at this time any challenges the Welsh and the Norman end of the population, or was that later on? In, in England or in, in, in Roman England, general? Within, within the crown authority and Thomas Cranmer's marching orders. Uh, I, don't, I don't honestly know right off the top of my head. We could talk about that, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, 
I know that the, the, you know, we go from Henry to Edward uh, to Mary, where everything goes backwards again, and then back to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, which we'll say in a second, really tried to get things peace, calm down and peaceful. Uh, and to some degree, she made choices about how far she was going to push people into the system. Uh, that's about as much. I don't know specifically about Wales or Cornwall. Um, so we've got sources from scripture, we've got sources from history, we've got sources from the Roman Catholic Church. And then as we talked about, all of that, if those are the ingredients, sort of the mixing bowl of all of that is that Reformation ethos that we've talked about in Europe. Uh, the church had become heavy and just more and more had been piled into liturgy, more and more days, more and more prayers, uh, more and more options, and, and you know, frankly, more ways to get people into church. Uh, so there a, a very much a movement for simplifying and keeping things regular, but making it simpler, making it more, uh, what was the right word for it, but making it more apparent to people as they came to liturgy why we were there, why this day we were having this lesson, and what, what we were trying to get, rather than this endless loop of constant images. Also, the medieval theological
gone is any concept that communion is anything other than a symbolic act that reminds us that Jesus did this once with his disciples. There's no presence, there's no grace, no real presence, there's no grace. We are just reenacting something Jesus did because he told us to reenact it, and it reminds us uh, that, that Jesus did that. Uh, gone is any idea that we offer anything to God in our liturgy because God doesn't need anything from human beings. You know, how, how uh, presumptuous of us to think that we somehow please God by offering either gifts of money or bread and wine or gifts of praise and thanksgiving. God doesn't need that, so get rid of all that. And then the so-called black rubric, uh, you, some of you may have heard of that, slipped in after Parliament approved the 1552 book was this rubric that said, you sh when you receive communion, you shall stand or, or sit. If you cannot stand, you shall not kneel. There shall be no adoration of the host and no, no idea that Jesus is in the bread and wine, therefore you shall not worship or pray to or anything like that. Uh, you know, convoluted history here, but it gives you a feeling of how you know, radically stripped down those liturgies were. Didn't last very long, though. Edward dies a year later. Mary, Mary the only, I was going to say Mary the first, Mary the only, uh, exceeds to the crown, restores England to a Roman Catholic crown, uh, all, all, everything we just talked about goes out the window. She dies, however, in 1559 uh, after a fairly bloody rule, which frankly looks a bit mirrors, but she doesn't get as much press. But Elizabeth I comes, comes to the throne. Uh, she is a devout, uh, she's a devout Christian. She's actually a fairly um, attentive liturgist. She has very definite beliefs about how the church should be. She tended to the more ceremonial, more elaborate side of things, but she had the wisdom that she had in so many things to know how to sort of cut down the middle and say, this is what I like, and frankly, this is what I might do in my private chapel, but the book for the people, the book, the book of common prayer, needs to embrace a wider swath of liturgical practice and, liturgical, and, and, the, and theological beliefs. And that's what we get with it. Via or via media, the middle way uh, comes into vogue then. The, the belief of the theologian, the wisdom of the theologian, which I think is right, is they were trying to, two ways to say it. The, the traditional way to say it is they were trying to bridge the gap between the radical Puritans who wanted essentially almost no ceremony and no, break, no uh, expression of grace and worship, and the people who harken back to the, to the days of Rome and therefore created this. The more, um, uh, how shall I say this? Uh, the, the more self-referential way to say that, uh, which the dean of my seminary, who is the Brit, always said, is that what Elizabeth was doing was actually preserving the native or natural church. The middle way was actually the way the church was always supposed to be, ignoring the excesses of Rome and the excesses of Puritanism. Uh, so whether you say that she was making a compromise or she was trying to return the church to the way it always should have been, you can guess. But she, her genius was keeping a prayer book that, in keeping everybody modestly unhappy, managed to keep the church together, right? For, for another hundred years, fast forward then to the British Civil Wars, um, fought for many, many reasons, of course, but particularly the Second Civil War was just a brutal, uh, truly brutal, and shameful, from, from our point of view as Christians, shameful uh, period of religious warfare over liturgy, over whether we celebrate Christmas, over whether people get to read the prayer book in their own language, over whether people should sell to receive communion, over whether we should have these days. All of these things that, as, as, as they settled out over 500 years for us, who, who, who would almost, who would argue about it, but if you are about it, who would fire guns at one another over these things? But that was the fervor of the day, that there was a right way and a wrong way to worship, and there were two sides that said they had the right way. Second the War, the Restoration, Charles, uh, James Russell, Charles II comes to the throne, and under him, in 1662, we get the prayer book that is the book of common prayer of the Church of England to this very day. 
Uh, their prayer book is over 400 years old. Uh, it was accepted by Parliament in 1662. Again, kind of an amalgamation of the Puritan low church on the one side and the more, you can have the term Anglo-Catholic then, so maybe the more Catholic high side, kind of blended together. Uh, more in an effort to talk about, uh, to, start, to, to keep the peace of the church in light of the bloody, bloody decades that had come to it. Uh, and there's a great deal, I think, of wisdom on this. So it is still the official book of the church today. Um, there have been various reform movements, the most recent quote unquote, the most recent one was in the 1920s. All of the bishops of the Church of England approved a fairly modest but modernizing revision of the 1662 prayer. Charles accomplished this before Old Irons died. Before Cromwell. Well, this is so Cromwell is in the Civil War. The Char this is Charles II. This is oh, so Charles. I thought you said Charles I. No, 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 no. This is, everything. Sorry, everything I said about that was Charles II. Right after after the Civil War. Um, in the 1920s, the Church approved a new prayer book. Uh, Parliament rejected it. Par the church is an established church. Parliament, under the King or Queen, has the ultimate authority over the church. They rejected the revisions. One of the key reasons was that there was provision for reserved Sabbath. Uh, that if you had, if you could either intentionally or unintentionally consecrate too much bread and wine, that you could then reserve the sacristy as we do, whether to give to people who are sick when you call upon them, or for the more liturgical purposes that I just talked about. Parliament would have none of that. That was too too Catholic for them in their, in their words. Uh, and so we're stuck, uh, the Church of England is stuck with the 1662 prayer book. Uh, I will say, though, they have created a great deal of resources. Um, they have a beautiful set of volumes. About that they don't show, called Common Worship, that started in the 80s, got finalized more in the 90s and early 2000s, that are modern versions of everything that's in the prayer book, and then a lot added to it. And both what I've experienced in England and what I've been told is that in most parish churches, that's what you actually want to hear on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday evening is out of Common Worship. 1662 is there as the authoritative book. Cathedrals might use it, you might use it once once a year for a historical service. But technically speaking, the, the book that was approved in 1662 is still the church's uh, official version. Is the Anglican Church, uh, of the Anglican Church, or Church? I don't understand Anglican So, accident of history. So, almost everywhere in the world, the church that comes out of Canterbury is known as the Anglican Church. Because we fought a war for independence, we didn't want to be known as the Anglican Church. So we picked, you know, Protestant Episcopal, Protestant to emphasize that we're not, uh, that we're actually well, Catholic, and Episcopal because we have bishops, as opposed to the congregational form that was, you know, so prevalent. So the Episcopal Church has a different prayer book, slightly different. Yeah, every, every nation or province in the Anglican Communion has its own prayer book. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, but we all, we all kind of look to Rome we all kind of look to Canterbury. Wow. I mean, I go across the street. Uh, we all look to Canterbury as sort of the, as the, 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 the parent, the C, S, E, E, of, of the church, but there's no official governance structure. Each of the churches, including the Episcopal Church, is its own independent entity with its own independent prayer. That's the way it was in the early days. What do you know? In Europe and in the East. Right, exactly, exactly. And, and frankly, if you look at what's happening in the United Methodist Church right now, they have a different policy where all the churches from, I don't know where the United Methodist Church is, but wherever that is, <laughs> so I guess down the top of Dover, uh, everything rolls up to one gigantic body. And so whenever you have big disagreements, you see systems because mm -hmm. the national churches, you know, they, they, they're, they're, the national churches kind of agree, but because they have to, they have to agree at this international level and they can't, end up with, with these big splits. But today there are uh, former Episcopal churches that identify themselves with the Anglican church, when, uh, and those churches have issues with the Episcopal church. Absolutely. And, and, so, and so rather than identify with the Episcopal church in the United States, they identify themselves with the Anglican church internationally. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they do, although interestingly, the Canterbury does not recognize 
Ambassador Plum Penitentiary is engaged to hint to Bishop Seabury that he could go to college. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. Interesting. I have the book. <laughs> so, a great deal of, uh, if you look at the capital R reform side, definitely anti charismatic side, they don't have any bishops at all. They, they actually created their polity to exclude bishops. Uh, that there was nobody who was any better than anybody else to oversee. So, they don't, they don't have it. Mark, I don't know, does the Lutheran Church have apostolic succession with its bishops? Um, it does, but the Episcopal Church kind of doesn't. So that um, once the uh, the concordat, the agreement between Lutherans and Episcopalians happened, um, at any Lutheran pastor that is ordained has an Episcopal bishop there with the Lutheran bishop for the ordination. <laughs> so that when my generation is dead, all the Lutheran pastors will be in the apostolic succession through the bishops and the So let me just finish.
finish up briefly, I'll just take it. So, 1789 prayer book with some of these new additions, some trimmed, some of these trimmed out the prayers for the monarch uh, and for parliament are, are changed, but those are more, more formal, formalities. But the, the liturgical change that we talked about in Scotland was the biggest. Modest movements uh, to reform the prayer book in 1892. Uh, so we went almost 100 years. Uh, so the second American prayer book came out in 1892. The third came out in 1928, only you know, roughly 30 years later. Uh, and what you see in that, and that's where we'll end today, not only did the new prayer book come out in 1928, but for the first time the church established a standing committee on liturgy. Because what was beginning to happen, and this is where we'll pick up next week, this liturgical movement, capital L, capital M, has begun to come in and capture the imagination of the entire Western church. This idea that we understand, we understand more historically what happened and we can begin to apply that both theologically and liturgically to how we, how we should be worshiping in the future. So the liturgical movement, as the teacher to close this, is sort of the bridge between the 1928 prayer book and the 1979 prayer book. It took us 50 years to get there, but we were also among one of the first churches to produce a book in 79 uh, that was the product of that. So that's where we'll pick up next week. Questions? I'm happy to stick around with Yes, if you want to borrow these for the next couple of weeks, yeah. yeah. Uh, you talked about sort of a worm theology and, yeah. and the idea worm. that you know, we're totally unworthy, so we have to have perfection before we can, before we can uh, get to the moon. And that, that the element of that is still in order because we always have to. Is it permissible to have, in the Episcopal Church, to have communion without having confession? It is. There's a rubric that says that the general confession may be omitted on a um, the, the tradition that's grown up around that, if there is one, is to often move it during the seven weeks of Easter time, uh, which, we, which I do here, and also I do it at Christmas too. But those are the joyful seasons where we're celebrating the, the most abundantly the grace of Christ. So you don't need it. Um, it would not be permissible to never do it. It is, right. it is a required element. Yeah. And that's only in right two, right one.